One of the horrible things about nuclear war, nuclear weapons, is their ubiquity. There is nowhere to hide from them. As we know from previous episodes on Ireland, New Zealand and Australia, countries of course with no nuclear weapons, they still had plans to buckle down in the event of nuclear war as they expected to be hit with fallout. You can be as clean and pure and removed from the nuclear game as you like, but it'll still get you. The fires, the blasts, the fallout, the nuclear winter, the economic breakdown, the shortages, the panic, the anarchy. Yeah, if it happens, it will get you in some way. Nowhere is safe. The Trinity Test of 1945 was like whipping a blanket off of the world. Forever after, you're going to be a bit colder, a bit more uncomfortable, a bit more exposed. Because now the bomb is everywhere. And this episode looks at how, in the 1960s, the nuclear fallout from atmospheric testing was so hideously present on Earth that it even made its way into our children's teeth. Our past few episodes have been about nuclear testing. Initially, tests were all atmospheric tests, meaning they were done above ground. But as awareness grew about the risks of fallout and radioactive contamination, more and more tests were being conducted underground. And then in 1963, the Partial Test Ban Treaty came into place, which banned all nuclear tests in the atmosphere, in space, had anyone been so inclined, and underwater. It was now underground or nothing. Well, not everyone agreed with that treaty, of course. Do a Google image search for the signing of the treaty, and you'll see Kennedy, and you'll see Khrushchev. You won't see de Gaulle. France just went on conducting atmospheric tests. They didn't sign. And then China, who got the bomb the year after the treaty was signed, well, they didn't sign up either and had plenty of atmospheric tests. According to Wikipedia, China were still doing atmospheric tests as late as 1980. A quick calculation of all nuclear tests by all current nuclear powers suggests there have been about 559 atmospheric tests in total. So that's... A lot of fallout we've created. Indeed, man has created so much radioactive fallout since 1945 that some people argue it has helped push humanity into a new epoch, the Anthropocene. We're currently in a geological epoch called the Holocene, And that dates from the last Ice Age. And during the Holocene, the climate has been relatively stable, things have been nice and dandy, and civilization has flourished. Lovely. But some people argue the Holocene is over, and that we should declare a new epoch, the Anthropocene. And the arguments for a new epoch are that mankind has made such an impact on the Earth through introducing radioactive fallout, but also through climate change, pollution, plastics, and the extinction of certain species, that we are now certainly in a new geological epoch. Quoting from The Guardian here, in an article about that from 2016, 
To define a new geological epoch, a signal must be found that occurs globally and will be incorporated into deposits in the future geological record. For example, the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous epoch is defined by a golden spike in sediments around the world of the metal iridium, which was dispersed from the meteorite that collided with Earth to end the dinosaur age. For the Anthropocene, the best candidate for such a golden spike are radioactive elements from nuclear bomb tests, which were blown into the stratosphere before settling down to Earth. Speaking of signals which indicate we've been shoved into a new epoch, one of the most prominent is plutonium. Let me quote here from a book that I'm obsessed with and find myself referring to all the time in this podcast, Fallout by Fred Pierce. I reviewed it uh, a year or two ago in The Economist, but The Economist, quite rightly, lies behind a strict paywall so you won't be able to read it. Uh, Even I can't read it because I don't have a subscription to The Economist. It's a bit too expensive for me. If you have access to The Economist website, or if you're a real Economist nerd and collect back copies, you can read my review there. But I'll summarise it for you by saying this book is brilliant. Fallout by Fred Pierce. So let me read you a quote here about plutonium and the Anthropocene. Primary signal of this new age of humankind, referring to the arguable new age that we're now in, the primary signal of this new age is the arrival of plutonium fallout from the first bombs. Plutonium is a new element created by atomic scientists for its bomb-making potential. Having been sprayed round the world by the fallout of bomb tests, it is now everywhere. Bound to soils, in vegetation and accumulating on the floors of the oceans. It is our unique signature on the planet and it will be around for millions of years, emitting its radiation as it decays. That dates the start of the Anthropocene to sunrise on July 16th, 1945, when the first bomb containing plutonium was exploded over the desert of New Mexico. It was the dawn of a new age. It is no wonder nukes stir such emotion in us. So then, there's a whole lot of fallout on the planet put there by us. But we don't need scientists quibbling over the dating of geological epochs to tell us that. As discussed in previous episodes, public awareness of fallout started growing in the 50s with the creation of the hideous hydrogen bomb. And when the US's Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb test in 1954 exploded with a far greater yield than the scientists predicted, it threw fallout far beyond the exclusion zone, contaminating the Lucky Dragon Japanese fishing boat, making the crew sick and killing one of them. This made news around the world, of course. And so gradually the bomb stopped being a thing of science and glamour and the dazzling possibilities of the future. See last week's episode where it was likened to sex and feminine beauty and the knockout glamour of a bathing beauty in a bikini. Now the mushroom clouds rising over Nevada could be seen as sinister. Instead of raising a glass on the roof of a Las Vegas hotel as you saw these clouds on the horizon, perhaps you should be getting safely undercover. If these clouds could kill a fisherman out at sea, what might they be doing to the American citizens who lived downwind of the bomb? Now, speaking of people who lived downwind suggests that you only needed to be concerned if you were in the path of the mushroom cloud or in the path of winds which are blowing the mushroom clouds, but not so. Fallout gets everywhere. If the mushroom cloud rises high enough, it can deposit some of its radioactive material in the stratosphere, and it can remain there for a while, taking its time, drifting and descending anywhere across the globe. But those who are downwind of the bombs were of course subject to a far more concentrated dose of radiation, 
The rest of us are getting some kind of low-level background radiation, but the downwinder's got something far more serious. So how did concerned Americans, not just the downwinders, but the scientific community, know how much fallout people were receiving? One method of measuring it was the baby tooth survey. This project was started in St. Louis, Missouri in 1959 and aimed to study the presence of strontium-90 by examining baby teeth. But first, before we look at the survey and the collection of little baby teeth, what is strontium-90? Well, incredibly, it simply didn't exist before 1945. It was unleashed by nuclear explosion. Strontium-90 is a bit uh, sly and clever because it almost copies the behaviour of calcium in that it lodges itself in human bones and teeth. And that makes children particularly vulnerable to strontium-90 because their little bones and teeth are of course still growing. And traditionally, children are fed a lot of milk. Strontium-90 has been described as a bone seeker, which sounds like a title for a horror film. This bone seeker, having found your bone, will settle in there where it can cause bone cancer and leukaemia. Many people in uh, St. Louis were concerned about this because studies of milk were showing that uh, St. Louis had an unnaturally high level of strontium-90 in its milk. But was this strontium-90 making its way to the people of Missouri, to the children of Missouri, to their little teeth? The Baby Tooth Survey was set up to try and answer that question. The project asked that children send their freshly lost baby teeth in an envelope to the survey. I assume, of course, that the mums and dads had to explain to their children how the tooth fairy would have approved of this practice. And maybe she would collect the tooth from under the pillow and then post it onwards on the kids' behalf. <laughs> Either way, forms were sent out to St. Louis schools and posters were displayed in the corridors asking the children to please participate. And some of the information leaflets and cards surrounding the baby tooth survey did actually have a fairy on it. Uh, I'll put a picture of this up on Twitter and on my Facebook page. But um, Operation Tooth, as it was called, the card has a picture of a gap tooth smiling child with some atoms flying around, or the symbol of an atom, and a fairy. So even though this was a scientific survey, they still kept the image of a tooth fairy involved. Don't want to ruin the illusions and the happy little thoughts of any kids too soon. So when the tooth comes out, you pop it in an envelope and send it onwards to the tooth survey. Schools were involved, as I said, in uh, displaying posters, handing out forms, but um, scouts and YMCA clubs, church groups, local libraries and chemists also got involved. And when the child sent their tooth off to the survey, with mum being instructed to wrap it in cotton wool or tissue and then sellotape it to a piece of card, they would get a, a badge in return saying, I gave my tooth to science. Now, those little badges must have appealed to the children because the survey received over 300,000 baby teeth. As well as receiving a little badge, the kids who sent their teeth in would also get a card which said, this card shows that I am a member of the Operation Tooth Club with full privileges and I'm entitled to wear the membership button. Because science needs my teeth when they fall out, I will continue sending them to Operation Tooth. So the survey was measuring strontium-90 in children's teeth. As we said, strontium-90 is a bone seeker. Teeth, of course, aren't bone, but they are relatively similar to bone. I, I don't know the science behind it or the biology of it, but teeth are sufficiently similar to bone that scientists could draw conclusions from uh, a loose tooth far easier, of, of course, than trying to obtain bone. Now, initially, the envelopes containing the teeth would go rattling through the door of a Dr. Louise Reese, who was one of the survey's organisers. But there are only so many teeth one person can take. And as the operation grew and grew and more and more teeth were rattling through the door, the whole thing was eventually moved to Washington University's School of Dentistry. And that is where the hundreds of thousands of teeth were sent and where the studies were done. 
Now, the Baby Tooth Survey, it was created by a group from St. Louis, Missouri, called the CNI, the Committee for Nuclear Information. And that group began life, uh, as was so often the case in the 50s, as a group of well-meaning middle-class ladies who gave their time to philanthropy and campaigning. It was a collection of activists, uh, trade unionists, um, a former campaigner for women's suffrage, um, some local doctors and um, a socialist. They all joined forces and they began to campaign against hydrogen bomb tests. Now, the residents of St. Louis had reason to be concerned, as we've said, because the milk from St. Louis was showing very high levels of strontium-90. And if you look at my previous episode called Wind Scale and Atomic Milk, we'll see how it's always milk which shows radiation after a nuclear incident the quickest. That's because after any kind of nuclear accident, local milk supplies always have to be thrown away because the fallout or the contamination will descend onto grass and cows then eat the grass and the contamination comes through quickly in their milk. So that's one of the first foodstuffs where you always spot the contamination. It's always the milk. So St. Louis was showing worryingly high levels of strontium-90 and our group of women demanded action of the local authorities and they refused to be brushed off. They also hated the fact that they, as members of the public, were being treated like children. They resented the fact that the political establishment seemed to think that, oh, they're just locals, all these locals, yokels, ordinary folk, they don't need the truth in Strontium 90. What would they do with it if they had it? They were being treated like children, not able to handle or analyse the truth. And so when these ladies got together, realised they were being fobbed off, they formed the Committee for Nuclear Information, which was a demand to be treated like responsible adults and to be presented with the nuclear reality. What are these hydrogen bomb tests doing to our air, our water, our pasture, our milk, our children's bodies? Lacking the plain truth from the establishment, they set up the Baby Tooth Survey to get the truth from teeth instead. So the Baby Tooth Survey, it ran for years, gathered um, about 300,000 teeth. It ran until 1970, actually, long after, of course, atmospheric tests had stopped. So they accrued a massive amount of teeth. The laboratory must have been absolutely rattling with tiny little baby teeth. And when they tested them to see what the levels of strontium-90 were, the results were shocking. The results showed that children born in 1963, which was when atmospheric testing was stopped, these children had levels of strontium-90 in their baby teeth that were 50 times higher than children born in 1950. Evidence then that the radiation from America's nuclear testing was reaching the population, reaching the very teeth of its children. The authorities might have swept away any concerns and told you not to worry, But all those baby teeth in the laboratory in Washington proved that strontium-90 was coming from the bomb and making its way all the way down the chain to little children's bodies. To all of our bodies. Now, we started this episode looking quickly at the Partial Test Ban Treaty, which banned atmospheric testing. The treaty was signed in 1963, And it was in 1963 that these baby tooth survey results were published, showing the massively increased levels of strontium-90 in children's teeth. The report was shown to President Kennedy, and it is credited with helping him decide that, yes, this partial test ban needs to be enacted. We need to stop atmospheric tests. So strontium-90 made its way to little teeth. Little teeth made their way to a dentistry lab, and the lab report made its way to the Oval Office and helped get atmospheric tests banned. Well, banned by the two big boys, America and the USSR, and Britain too. Don't forget us. us. The topic for this episode was requested by one of my patrons, Liz Rivard. Liz actually remembers her own little baby teeth being sent to a similar survey in Canada in the early 60s. Being able to request a podcast topic is a benefit available to some of my patrons. So if you want to support the podcast with a donation each month, 
and get various nuclear rewards, please look at patreon.com forward slash Atomic Hobo. I currently have a batch of about six patrons who are waiting for various nuclear gifts to be sent to them. They are here on my desk, they're all parceled up. I'm just <laughs> dreading going to the post office because of lockdown. And I know that someone will shout at me, um, you're standing in the wrong place, queue outside, are these parcels essential? But I will brave it for my patrons. So let's give a shout out this week to the patrons who are waiting for their presents. Liz Rivard, Kylie, Ashlyn, Stephen Deutsch, Liz Murdoch, Tom Higgins and Martin Edwards. And welcome to my new patron, Anna Gilbraith, who joined last week. And I think we have lots of new listeners to the podcast this week, following our review in the Times. So welcome to all new listeners, I'm so glad you're here and I hope you enjoy our nuclear horrors. Let me tell all the new listeners that I'm currently writing a book about our preparation for nuclear war and that will be published soon by Bodley Head. You can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDowell, on Facebook as Nuclear Britain, or on my website juliemcdowell.com. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, of course, to all my patrons who keep this podcast going and keep it free of horrible ads. Please do tell your friends if you enjoy the podcast. A word of mouth recommendation is always the best way to get this out there. Apart from a review in the Times, of course. So thank you everyone and I will be back next Monday with another episode.